this video, we're going to look at yet another version of the ad hominem fallacy that we call guilt by association. And we're going to do eight main things. We're going to talk about what the ad hominem, you know, guilt by association variety is. We'll look at the structure of the argument involved. We'll talk about what makes this a fallacy, why it's bad reasoning. We'll explore some common situations in which you can expect to see this popping up. We'll look at three specific examples of the fallacy, th three pretty funny ones actually. We'll um, talk about some pointers for how to spot this when other people are committing it. And for those of you who are students who need to be able to distinguish this from other fallacies, we'll go over a few other similar fallacies that it might get mistaken for and how to tell them apart. And then we'll talk about how you can avoid this fallacy in your own life, your own thinking, your own communication, your own interactions with other people. So what is the guilt by association fallacy? First off, we need to note it's got several different synonyms. It's sometimes called the company you keep, it's said in a disapproving manner, uh, the association fallacy, the bad company fallacy, or X baiting, where X could be, you know, race or class or gender, whatever you, whatever you like, you know, uh, model train collectors, you know, baiting in the sense of, of saying, well, you're one of those people. Now, it's a variety of the ad hominem fallacy uh, in, in that it focuses on the connection or a similarity between the person who's making a claim and some other person who is being attacked or rejected, and you're, you're transferring that to the, the, the person who's making the claim. The claim is being rejected on the basis of this association, of this connection, of this similarity between the two people. So you say that because this other person over here is morally bad or unreliable or somebody that we shouldn't pay attention to, the other person who's making some, some other claim can be rejected. There is a variety of this where it works precisely by saying, hey, you know who else says that sort of thing? Hitler or, you know, whoever else you, you really don't like. Um, um, Mao Zedong, you know. Um, in that case, you're just sort of cutting through the the uh, stuff and, and, you know, saying this is a bad claim because somebody else who's equally reprobate to you is making this kind of claim. What is the structure of this fallacy? So this is a little bit complicated here. There's a lot of hidden premises that we should look at. One of the above the board premises is A claims X to be true. A is the person who's going to be attacked. The uh, premise that, that is also being laid out there is A has some sort of similarity to another person, B, and we'll call that similarity Q. Uh, now here's the hidden premise. B is morally bad or unreliable or stupid. It might be made explicit, but oftentimes, you know, if you pick the right person, for instance, Hitler, right? Uh, we all know he's a bad guy, so who wants to be like him? Uh, that can be left implicit. Um, depending on your audience, there may be people who in sort of the common culture, there's no problem with, but, you know, within a particular subclass, you can just say, oh, that, that person's like Bush or that person's like Obama or, you know, and then you can dismiss them, right? Here's the other hidden premise. If A and B have Q in common, then A is also morally bad or unreliable. That's a big stretch now, isn't it? So that's something that you should be sort of honing in on as a weak point of the argument. The conclusion is going to be that X is false. And notice you need those two implicit premises to get from the other premises to that conclusion. We can represent this graphically in this way. And there could be a little bit of collapsing of some of these categories. Um, you know, perhaps the similarity is, in fact, the defect. Um, but, but let's lay it out like this. So we've got two people, person A and person B. Person B has got some sort of defect that we're trying to transfer to person A. And why? Because we want to reject A's claim that X is true and say X is false. So what we do is we use that similarity between them as a kind of bridge in order to do this. Now, what's wrong with this? Why is this a fallacy? We always need to remind ourselves that claims are true or false in general, independently of the person who is making the claim, or in this case, who that person is associated with. So another thing to keep in mind, just because someone else who makes a similar or the same claim is morally bad or uninformed or manipulative or, you know, uh, you know, steals your, your food out of the refrigerator in the lunchroom or whatever you, you don't like, right? That doesn't make that same claim made by the other person false. 
It takes more than that to make a claim false. And it ignores or downplays relevant dissimilarities between the people who are being associated quite often. So um, when should we expect to, to see this? When should we be on our guard? It occurs in situations in which people are making claims that other people are making or have made. That covers a lot of ground, doesn't it? Because oftentimes we're making claims that are not totally original, um, especially if we're talking about policy or you know moral issues or even aesthetic issues. So it's going to occur in a wide variety of contexts, ranging from personal relationships and conflicts. Oh, you're just like my dad who said X, Y, Z. Uh, or you're like my past relationship where he or she would you know say that and you're doing the same thing. Um, you're just like them. Um, politics and policy making. Uh, it's funny because every time, you know, this is a sign of how screwed up American politics are. Nobody wants to be the last president. So now that we have, you know, a Democratic president soon to retire, everybody's going to disassociate themselves from him and say, I'm not Obama. In the previous crop, uh, you know, everybody had to say, I'm not Bush. And instead, uh, you know, the opponents are always saying, oh, he's just like that guy or she's just like that guy. Um, so that, that happens a lot with that. Um, student papers and discussions. I have seen so many discussions in classrooms and so many student papers where something is dealt with by saying, you know who else thought that? Or you know who else uh, made a, a claim along those lines? Hitler did or the Nazis did. And that's, that's horrible reasoning. Um, you know, but this, this is a common fallacy. Um, journalism and editorials. Journalists like to do guilt by association, by innuendo, by, you know, saying, oh, we, I'm not quite saying that they're in bed together, but, you know, there's a, something there going on. And they, they want you, you as the audience to sort of read between the lines. Uh, and unfortunately, many audiences are all too willing to do that. The workplace. Um, it's very easy, depending on the company you keep, to get uh, tagged with other people's uh, mistakes or policies or, or pre you know, presuppositions or all sorts of assumptions along those lines. Um, sales, marketing, and advertising often uses this, particularly against competitors, their opponents in the marketplace, not only of, you know, buying and selling, but also of ideas and imagination. So these are uh, very common situations in which you can expect to see this kind of thing. Let's look now at a few examples. This first example is kind of funny. Uh, you'll see why in just a minute. I call it all those ivory tower professors. My opponent clearly plans to take you taxpayers for a ride with respect to the education bill. He's a college professor, after all. You know his fellow college professors all tend to be tax and spend liberals. Look at him. His office shares the same hallway with theirs. And go, How can he possibly be different than them? Well, believe it or not, there are some professors who aren't leftists necessarily. There are even a few conservative professors in the academy, although uh, if you look at the stats for, for certain professions like philosophy or sociology or religious studies, not a hell of a lot of them, but there are some. So you can't automatically assume that just because somebody uh, you know, shares a hallway with other people that he has the same points of view or she has the same points of view. Um, let's look at the second example. Uh, this is one for our current election cycle. Neither Hillary nor Jeb. We've already had eight years each of those political dynasties, the Clinton and the Bush. We already know exactly what their policies will be and who they'll bring into the government. Just look at their family members. Don't vote for either one of them. By the way, full disclosure, I hope that the you know the the best candidate to vote for will not be uh, Clinton or Bush, uh, in part because I don't like dynasties, and in part because I don't like either of them, and in part because I don't particularly care for either party. Um, but uh, should, is this a good reason to to dismiss them? No. Um, is Hillary Clinton, Bill Clinton, you know, just in a, a different form? No. Is is Jeb Bush the same thing as George Bush? No, um, they do deserve, deserve to be evaluated on their own merits. Here's, here's a great example. Uh, I live in the state of New York, and I, I was listening to a, a show with a 
person who just did a biography of of uh, Andrew Cuomo, uh, who's our, our governor, and he was very well liked by Bill Clinton, and he became part of the the policy making team. He was part of the the uh, administration, uh, and the question was, would that happen under Hillary Clinton? Hillary doesn't appear to like him, uh, so you can bet that he's probably not going to be be in there. Um, there's certain things that were tolerated under the former Clinton administration that if we have a new Clinton administration, probably won't be tolerated, you know, having to do with, you know, sexual peccadilloes and that sort of thing. Um, and we can say the same thing about other other candidates as well. So, you know, there could be plenty of reasons not to vote for either one of these two, but this is not a good argument why you shouldn't vote for them. Um, here's another one that happens a lot. We know your type. There's no way that he's innocent. He's got friends, family members, and known associates who are in prison. You hang around with that sort, and they're bound to corrupt even the best character. And this guy didn't start out even with that, so he must be guilty of the crime. Those other ones were guilty of the crime. His claim that he's not guilty, we can dismiss that on the basis that, you know, he's got these, these similarities with these other people. Um, this is a classic case of guilt by association, and it's fallacious. Now, how do you spot this? What, do you should, what should you be on the lookout for? Pay attention to the references that are being made to similarities between the person making a claim and other people. You want to ask whether the associations that are being noted are actually genuine. That, that could be uh, not the case right off the bat. And then even more importantly, are they relevant to the discussion? Do they actually inform the discussion? Do they give you some basis on which you can decide whether the claim is, is likely to be true or false? Very often you'll find that the, the associations are not relevant. Also be on guard with people who tend to think in a kind of sloppy way uh, by association. They have these schemas that they, they just you know shove people into, pigeonholing them you know, in effect. Uh, you know, it, it, often done in very oversimplistic ways. You know, I, I see this a lot in the history of ideas with people saying, oh, you know, well, this person came from this country, so therefore they have this mindset, uh, just like their compatriots over here. Or this person, you know, studied under this person, so therefore they have to think this way. And that's not a good way to, to think about these, these sorts of matters. Um, now, for those of you who are students and need to be able to distinguish this from other fallacies, let's talk about some of the other ones. This sometimes may be confused with other types of the ad hominem fallacy, like the abusive fallacy or the circumstantial versions. The key to distinguishing these is going to be looking at the exact grounds for dismissing the person's claims. If you're attacking somebody, say, on their family connections, and you say, oh, you're the no-good son of so-and-so, um, that's getting into the abusive, isn't it? Um, if you're saying, well, you belong to this particular group, and because you belong to that group or you have this background, you're not going to be a qualified person to, to address whatever issue it is, um, that is most likely a circumstantial. If you're saying, well, look, you know, what you're saying is like what this other person said, and we know that they're a bad person, now we got guilt by association. Or if you're saying, um, you know, you're saying something, but, you know, you've got these similarities to these people over here that we don't like, that's also guilt by association. Um, another one to think about, too, is bad analogy. This is sometimes kind of similar. Uh, a bad analogy fallacy may sometimes note similarities of claims or actions as the ground for the analogy being made. But this works a bit differently, as you'll see in the video once we've got it up, for the bad analogy fallacy than it does with the, the guilt by association fallacy. Guilt by association, you're primarily interested in rejecting a claim made by a person. Now, not every argument that focuses on associations between one's opponent and other people is necessarily a fallacious argument. You want to keep that in mind. Um, there are some cases where the associations of a person could, in fact, be relevant. Now, let's move on to the last thing. How do you avoid falling into this yourself? Number one is, when assessing the truth or the falsity of claims made by a person, Focus not on the similarities to other people, but on whether the claim can be justified or not independently of the possible or real associations or imaginary associations of the person making the claim. Also, when you see similarities between one person's position and that of other people who are distrusted or disreputable, 
ask whether those similarities are relevant to the case that's being considered. Remind yourself as well, this is very, very important, that the same claim can be made from a variety of different perspectives uh, and with justifications or bases that may in fact be at odds with each other. Just because two people advance the same position does not mean that they are somehow you know, in lockstep with each other on all sorts of other issues. There's, it's possible quite often to uh, argue for the same point from very opposed positions. The, the, you know, as they say, politics makes strange bedfellows. Um, the last thing I'd like to say is th this series, this uh, video is part of a, a larger series focused on the fallacies. And you're going to find uh, this series and, and many others being put into this new channel on critical thinking, logic, and argumentation. So if you like this video, uh, share it with other people, come back, see what we, we keep uploading and adding to uh, this, this channel. It's going to be a great resource for you if, you if you have an interest in critical thinking.